Welcome to The Porch Online. We're so excited that you're joining us this week. If you're close enough to The Porch, we wanna invite you to come join us in person. And if you're not, we're gonna encourage you to join a local church in your community because here at The Porch, we believe gathering is extremely important because we believe that you can go fast alone, but you'll go farther together. We hope that you enjoy this week's message and learn something new about God. Well, good morning, everybody. How's it going today? Good. Well, Luke alluded to it. Today is a very special day. So if you're in this room and you are a mother, will you please stand up so we can honor you? I know. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, ladies, stay standing for me. Stay standing for me. I know. I know. I'm sorry. Uh, special reason for why we have you standing today. One, we want to honor you. We want to say thank you. Literally, I would not be standing in front of you today had it not been for my mother who prayed for me. Um, and we have a special gift, and we wanted you to be easily identifiable so that we could pass these roses to you. Um, we picked pink roses today because pink roses signify and stand for uh, gratitude and appreciation. It literally is... My mom, the reason that I'm standing here, she prayed for me day in and day out while I was far from God. She never gave up on me. She never stopped showing a mother's love towards me. Um, and she never quit on me when there were a lot of times that I quit on myself. And you guys, you mothers are so important when it comes to your child's life and everything that is going on. And we just want to honor you and say thank you. So everybody else in the room, can we give a round of applause to our mothers? We love you. We are so grateful for you. You can have a seat now. And for others in the room um, and those watching online, I know, I know sometimes this day can be tough. I know sometimes this day can be frustrating. And so um, for those that are watching online and, and others in this room that maybe haven't had the opportunity to become mothers or don't have the opportunity to become mothers, we want to honor you too because we love you, we care about you, you're important, and you are um, you're leading people to become uh, Christ followers. You're partnering with parents, you're partnering with people, and I know um, as hard as that can be from time to time, uh, we want you to know that we honor you too. Um, so wanted to take a moment to do that and uh, let you know we love you. We're so excited uh, to be able to be with a group of mothers who love their kids. And I mean, these kids are incredible and you're doing an incredible job raising them, even if you feel like sometimes you're not. <laughs> you are. Um, but man, what a privilege. So let's get into it today, huh? Let's talk about what's going on. We're going we're gonna to We're going to continue our series on who is God. The three things that we said we're going to continue talking about every single time is, first and foremost, God is massive, right? Isaiah uh, 40, 12 says, Who has measured the depths of the water with the hollow of his hand? And who has measured the heavens, uh, or who has, with the breadth of his hand, marked off the heavens? Uh, also, it says in Exodus 34, verse 6, and you'll notice that I actually fixed the spelling this week of Yahweh in this title slide. So I finally got it done. I kept forgetting every week, and then they'd go up there and be like, I got to remember that next week. So I remembered. Um, but it says, and he passed in front of Moses, <clears throat> proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God. And the emphasis is mine, slow to anger. You'll never guess what we're talking about this week. Abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and the fourth generation. God is absolutely incredible. He's absolutely so large. So what do I got to do? I got to go to the source Exodus 34, because as Tozer says, A.W. Tozer says, what we think about God is the most important thing about us. It literally determines how our life goes and how it looks. And so us taking the time to understand who God is and to really dive deep in a deep dive on, on who he is is so important. And so today I want to start with a story. Is anybody out there a K-State basketball fan? 
right? Okay, a couple people, a couple people. Who remembers Frank Martin? Right? I, I definitely do. Um, my dad uh, used to referee Division One basketball, so when I was at K-State, he talked to Frank Martin about getting me in uh, as a manager. So I got to actually be a manager of the basketball team. Thanks, Dad. Cool experience. Um, but I got to be a manager of the basketball team. And I, I can tell you one thing about Frank Martin that you probably noticed on TV was he was not very slow to anger. I mean, it was quick, right? Now, the one thing I'll say about him, if he ever stumbles upon this, because I don't want to disparage him, he genuinely, outside of the lines of that basketball court, would have done anything for his players. He loved them well. He was a good coach in the aspect of making sure that they knew you call him at 3 o'clock in the morning. If you're in trouble, he's there. He was that kind of guy. So we're talking about inside the lines. I don't think he'll ever stumble across this message. But if he does, Frank, I want you to know that I saw that. But inside the lines, he was your like old-fashioned coach. He was like the coach that some of, the, some of the, the moms and dads in here grew up with. I definitely did. He just also happened to be my dad. No, I'm just kidding. Um, and all, all joking aside, my dad was a great coach. But Frank Martin would blow up quick. My favorite timeout that he had was they were playing horribly. And he called a 30-second timeout. And they had him on the screen. And the entire time, he's just standing there like this, just making eye contact <laughs> with every single player like this. Says no words for 30 full seconds. And then goes like this and turns back around and sits on the bench. I mean, he was quick to get frustrated and he was quick to get angry. And he didn't hide the fact that he was quick to get angry. He didn't hide it. He got after him. He coached the way he coached and he was a successful coach. But today I want to talk about God. And I want to talk about the aspect of God that is point number one today. God is slow to anger. I mean, think about it. How many of us grew up with a coach or a dad that was similar to Frank Martin? Or who of us grew up with a coach or a dad was, that was like the exact opposite of Frank Martin? Where it's like, you couldn't do anything to make that person eat. Like, you wanted your dad to get angry with you, so you knew that he cared. Right? Like, let's be honest. My dad never got angry at us unless we were doing something that we shouldn't be doing. That's what showed us he cared about us. Like, if he just let us live our lives however we wanted and willy-nilly and run around and be crazy, like, I wouldn't be probably alive. <laughs> Let's be honest. I probably would have just done all the dumb stuff. Like, teaching me to look both ways before crossing the street, something as simple as that, I got yelled at when I didn't do that. Not because he was mean, but because he didn't want me to step into the street and get hit by a car that was coming down the road when he could easily teach me, right? And so there's those two kinds of parents, right? There's the two kinds of parents where, um, there's three kinds of parents, but there's two that I'm talking about. There's the two that are, that are each ends of the spectrum. They never care at all, or they care and explode too fast. And I, I feel like what I want to explain today is God is kind of this Middle perfect version of a parent, right? God is slow to anger. And some of you in this room grew up in a place that was similar to that, that Frank Martin experience. You grew up in a place where your dad, your mom, whoever was taking care of you, coaches, grandparents, whoever it may be, you're thinking of that person right now, where they would just, you, you'd spill milk on the ground and it wouldn't, it wouldn't be like, hey, no big deal, grab a napkin clean it up, it's not a problem, it would be an immediate explosion. They'd go zero to 100 like that. And you're going, why are we crying over spilled milk? Like, what is the purpose here? And you think to yourself, oh my gosh, like, if I make the tiniest mistake, the whole world is going to come crashing on my head. So today, if we'll go back to that other slide, I, I, want, I want to point out this about God. Um, God is slow to anger. You see, so many times we beat ourselves up about the littlest mistake that we make. You know, we, we fall into a sin or into a temptation and we're like, 
I'm done now. I'm out. I've, God's so mad at me. And you're just, you picture God literally up in heaven just watching your every move like, oh, he made a mistake. Now I got to punish him. I got I to gotta smite him. Well, let's, can we go back to Nineveh for a minute? Let's go back to Nineveh. Do you remember God sent Jonah to Nineveh? We talked about it last week, and he, he was compassionate towards them. So this is after years and years and years of Nineveh making all these dumb mistakes that they were making. They were harsh. They were hurtful. We talked about it last week. They did things. Yet even the ancient world, where there was a lot of violence, made people's stomachs turn. Like that bad. And so we go to Nineveh, we see this, and then we fast forward 150 years to the prophet uh, Nahum, Nahum, however you want to say it. I call him Nahum, okay? So we fast forward 150 years. This is 150 years. Think about it. 150 years of this nation continually doing the same thing over and over again. How many people in this room would give somebody two chances, maybe, if they said, I'll never do that to you again, and then they did it again? You're like, hey, you just told me, oh, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. And then again, and you're like, okay, we're done. Just two, right? That's, that's normal people. That's people like me. Super patient people, maybe like five times. Extremely super patient people, maybe 10. God's like, I'm going to give you 150 years to figure this thing out. Plus the time before it, before I sent Jonah to you. So we're talking 250, 300 years that this country, this nation has been doing so much evil that it turns the stomachs of the people around them. And God says this through his prophet, a prophecy concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkoshite, I think I nailed it. The Lord, Yahweh, is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes his vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes. And his invents his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. Think about that. They come, they repent. Jonah comes, they repent. God waits 150 years. All of us will be dead in 150 years. All of us will be with Jesus, <coughs> celebrating, so we'll be alive. But we won't be here like, 150 years, that's a long time. Who could put up with something like that for, like, 15 days? You know what I mean? And God abhors evil. He hates it. But he puts up with it because he's slow to anger. The, the Greek in that, that slow to anger, I think is funny. But it, the Greek translation, I'm not going to butcher the word, but the Greek translation actually literally means long in the nostrils. I think it's really funny. Like, if we were to translate it literally, it'd be long in the nostrils. The way I picture that is God sees us make a mistake, and he goes, and then, like, that's the end of my breath, but God <laughs> keeps going, and you're just like, what, what in the world? Like, it's just this long, deep inhale, and then this exhale where he's not angry with me because he's like, you know what? Cooper's, Cooper's my son. He's, you know, an idiot sometimes, but he's still my son. <laughs> so we have to understand some of us in this room who grew up in a place and have this this idea of who God is, that, that he snaps real quick when we make mistakes, we have to realize that he actually is slow to anger. But now some of us grew up in a household where we could never make our dad or mom mad. And we think that we're going to take advantage of this grace. Like, well, Jesus died, died for my sins, so I can do whatever I want. But what we have to realize about God is that God is slow to anger. See, the emphasis is different depending on your perspective, right? Because God is slow to anger, which means he does what? He gets angry, right? It takes time, but God will eventually get angry. And some of us in this room are running around, living our lives the way that we think we want to live them, not being obedient to God, and nothing's happened to us yet, and nothing's occurred. And God, we still see the blessing of God on our life. And we still see all these things going right for us. And we're like, oh, it's fine. It's no big deal because God's just going to let me do whatever I want to do. But we forget the fact that God is slow to anger. He's patient. He's long-suffering. He's long in the nostrils, right? He's taking that deep inhale. And we see this in Habakkuk 3.2. It says, the Lord 
this is Habakkuk talking. He says, Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day, in our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. He's literally saying, in the midst of your wrath, remember this mercy. I don't know if you know anything about the background of Habakkuk, but Jerusalem and Judah was like making big mistakes. God was calling them an adulterer, chasing after other gods and all of these things. And Habakkuk goes to God and he says, hey, how long are you going to put up with this evil? He's like, actually, I'm done with it. He goes, great, me too. What are we going to do about it? He goes, I'm sending Babylon. And Habakkuk goes, what? Why would you send them? They're so evil. He's like, well, I'm sending them because I'm done with your evil. And their sin hasn't reached its fullness, but yours has. And so he sends Babylon to take over and send and destroy the temple and take over and send all the Jewish people, the, is, the Judas, or Judah left, into exile for 70 years because of their sin. You see, in Psalms 5, 5, 6, and 7, it says, Lord, I have heard of your fame and I stand in awe of your deeds. Repeat them in our day and our time and make them known. And in wrath, remember mercy. You see, the reality is there is still an understanding that God is slow to anger, but God does get angry. And you think to yourself, maybe, Cooper, what, what about this? You talk about God as love, like pre-decide to be love, right? Like, that's, that's what it is. And, and I want to say this, point number two is so clear. God is love. But wrath or anger is God's response to evil in the world. You see, like I said about my dad... When I would walk out in the street without looking both ways, he wasn't happy-go-lucky about that. He was angry with me about that. He was bringing correction to something that could harm me, right? God does the same thing. His response, his wrath is his response to evil. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that God is wrath, but without that anger and that frustration at the evil that's clearly destroying his creation... How can you truly love something if you allow that thing to get destroyed by the evil that's occurring in its, in its life, right? Or in, the, in, in our case, in the examples that I'm using as children of God, how could God be okay with the evil that is destroying our lives as his children? He couldn't possibly be if he truly loved us. And so what I want to point out is love does not equal tolerance. You see, in our world today, in the culture that we see going on is, if you don't agree with my lifestyle, you're hateful, or you're a bigot, or you're X, or you're Y, or you're Z, right? But that's not the reality of what love is. You see, if my dad was tolerant of me walking into the middle of the street without ever checking for cars, I wouldn't be standing before you today. I would have been struck by a car years and years ago. Love does not equal tolerance. There is a right way to address sin. There is a right way to address people living in sin. But it doesn't mean that we put up and tolerate everything. God doesn't. We shouldn't either. And you may be thinking to yourself, well, Cooper, you're pulling a lot out of the Old Testament. Well, yeah, that's true. And you may be thinking to yourself, well, the God of the Old Testament, he was full of that stuff. But Jesus, he was different. The Bible tells us that God's the same today as he was yesterday and he will be forever. And Jesus was Yahweh in the flesh. So if we're saying that he's different, we've got to be careful because that means we're not really truly understanding what's happening. Look at this. Jesus, more than any other teacher in all of scripture, preached repent, change your ways, become different. He says this in Matthew 4, 17, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. He didn't put up with people's behaviors. We like to pretend like Jesus put up with people's behaviors. We see the woman that was caught in adultery and thrown at his feet. Jesus tells the other people, those without sin, cast the first stone. And he meets her where she's at, he loves her where she's at, but if you stop there and you're like, yeah, see, Jesus was there, he actually stands up, which when you stand up and you take a position, you take a position above somebody to cast judgment, and he says, now, where are your accusers? I don't accuse you. 
Now go and live your life however you want. No, he doesn't say that. He says, now go and sin no more. Stop the evil that is so easily destroying your lives. The next thing he says in, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 8, so we kind of went backwards, but I liked it this order, because it says, produce fruit that comes with repentance. Like, Jesus was very clear. Your life should look different when you accept him. Your life should operate different when you accept him. And when I make a mistake, like when I was a kid and I didn't look both ways before I crossed the street, did sometimes I get yelled at, maybe potentially a spanking? Maybe. Potentially, yes, I can tell you that, yes, but guess what it taught me? It taught me to look both ways as a 33-year-old man still to this day so that I don't get hit by a car that's coming down the street at 35 miles an hour. It gave me the right way to go. We have to produce this repentance. You're like, well, that doesn't show Jesus getting angry. Cool, you're right. I'm I want to tell you this, though, in John chapter 2, verse 13 through 17, watch this. It says, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, I'm going to pause there. If you know anything about the Jewish people, especially in this time, they went to Jerusalem to sacrifice minimum once a year to the temples. By this time, depending on the, the scholarly time, Jesus is between the age of 30 and 33. So a lot of the Gospels put it at the end of his life. So it's right before he goes to the cross. So I'm going to go with he's probably 33 at this time. So at 33 years old, if Jesus just did the traditions of what Jewish uh, tradition was at that time and and just went to the temple one time a year, he saw this occurring, what we're about to talk about, occurring for 33 years before he ever addressed it. So this is what happens. He goes up to the temple. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered coins of money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get out of here and stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered it is written that he will have zeal. It is written, zeal for your house will consume me. For 33 years, year in, year out, Jesus saw this over and over and over again. You talk about patience. Because the zeal for his father's house didn't consume him at 33 years old all of a sudden. It was there the whole time. We read in Luke, we get one little glimpse into Jesus' childhood. And in Luke, he's teaching the teachers. And they were amazed at his authority at 12 years old. He was in the temple in that moment. He saw it going on around him. And for 33 years, Jesus was long in the nostrils. He was patient. He was long-suffering. He was taking those deep inhales. And finally, because he's slow to anger, he ended up getting angry, right? I mean, I don't know anybody in here has been chased with a whip before. I knew not to run when we were getting spankings, so I never was chased with it. But (laughs) I can't imagine it's a fun feeling. And I can't imagine Jesus was frolicking around with it. Like, he was probably in a pretty poor mood, in my opinion. Right? So he's angry. And there's things that I want to show. Because we're talking about the wrath of God, and you may be thinking to yourself, Cooper, what are we we talking about here? What does this look like, right? And so um, I've got this, this diagram it, it, I should have done the dimensions different. That's on me, but you can kind of see this. There's four types of wrath. There's an active wrath. There's a passive wrath. There's a present wrath, and there's a future wrath. So what does active present wrath look like? It looks like um, Uzziah, if you've read the story, when they try and bring the Ark of the Covenant into the temple the wrong way, reaches out to steady the Ark because it's about to fall off, and immediately is killed. We, and you say, oh, there's the Old Testament again. Well, let's look at Acts chapter 5. We see Ananias and Sapphira who have lied and grieved the Holy Spirit. And when they do that, immediately both of them drop dead. Now, this is not the typical wrath that we see of God. I picked two stories because there's about two stories in the scripture that we see of God's active and present wrath. 
There is an active in future wrath where the day of Yahweh comes that we see throughout scriptures where God will win, God comes back, and he dismantles and destroys all evil, right? Because that's what God's against. That's what his wrath goes against is evil. And so he comes back and he wins. He's the victor. He wears the victor's crown, period. Then we have passive. Passive is like Nineveh, what we were talking about earlier, and like Judah. When Babylon comes against them, God uses another Uh, vessel to send his judgment. And a lot of times it's not God sending a vessel to use his judgment. He actually will remove his hand of protection. And then passive future is death, where we all stand before God, before Jesus, and we are judged based on whether or not we accepted him as our Lord and Savior, because that's the only way to be righteous and holy, because our righteousness in our own is dirty rags that tear and strain But when we accept Jesus, we get the righteousness of Christ. And in that judgment, we actually are accepted into the family of God if we've accepted Christ's righteousness on us. But the main type of wrath that we see is passive. It's where God decides to remove his protection. So in Romans chapter 1, verse 24, 26, and 28, we see great examples of this. It says, Therefore, God gave them over to their sinful desires of their heart. They knew God's word, but they still chose to do their own thing, to move forward their own way. You guys can go ahead and click. I think I have those in there. Uh, One more. There you go. You can find that in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 26, it says, Because of this, because of the way they were acting and operating, God gave them over to their shameful lusts. In Romans chapter 1, verse 28, it says, God gave them over to a depraved mind. Why? Because they made the decision to continue, even though they knew the law of God, they made the decision to continue operating in their own strength, in their own sin, in their own desires. How many, and don't raise your hand, but how many of us in this room have seen that, obviously not in ourselves, but in somebody else, a friend, right? Like I have this friend who struggles with this thing, right? No, it's, but we continue operating in this place. Eventually God pulls his hand of protection off us. Eventually God says, you know what? If that's what you want to do, I'm not going to stop you. Point number three, and I got to hustle through this one, but it's probably the most important for us to walk out of this door with is God's anger is righteous. Ours is revenge. See, the reality is we are supposed to look like God. We're supposed to be grieved and angry about the things that God's grieved and angry about. We truly are. No questions. But the Bible tells us to not sin in our anger. And the reality is that's because a lot of times it's about wanting to get back at somebody. For me, it's, it's always this <laughs> emotion of driving. We keep coming back to that from the very first day I preached here to, to now, um, when I'm driving down the road and I see somebody doing something illegal, even though um, off the record, I plead the fifth if anybody calls me on this, I speed all the time, which is breaking the law. But if I see somebody else break the law, I'm like, get them, get them right now, <laughs> get them, right? I want to see them. I want to see them down the road, pulled over on the side of the road so I can be like, ha ha, got them, right? Like, but my frustration of the way they're driving is causing me to want to see them punish, Right? It's causing a vengeful response from me that's not healthy. It's not right. And God says, my anger is righteous. And James tells us this. He says, my dear brothers and sisters, in James chapter 1, verse 19, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and then we should look like God, slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. In James chapter 5, he says this, why should we be patient? Be patient, right? Slow to anger. This is why we should be patient. He said, be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. Can I say this today? Jesus is coming, and he's coming soon. Soon, okay? I'm not one of those people that's going to put a date on it. Soon to us, this one day is like a thousand years to God, and a thousand years is like one day, right? So soon to him is completely different than to me. But here's the reality. He's coming, and he's coming soon. And I can't wait for that day, personally. 
It's going to be glorious. But the Lord is coming. He's coming. He says this, see how the farmer waits, patience, right, to yield, or for the land to yield valuable crop, patiently waiting for autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord is coming near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. It's coming soon. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord, as you know. We count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. See, in our suffering, our response shouldn't be revenge. Is the feeling of anger real and okay? 100%. The Bible tells us not to sin in our anger. It doesn't say don't ever get angry. And so today, as I'm coming to a close, I want to think about that last point a little bit. First of all, we need to think about that last point and think about ourselves and think about when something occurs to me that upsets, upsets me, am I reflective or reactive? Do I actually think about what's going on? Do I actually reflect on the slowness of God to be angry with me because of all the things that I've done wrong to him? And then I think to myself, well, Josh did this thing to me. So I'm going to respond out of anger and react to him instead of be reflective and be slow to anger and patient. Are you angry? And by angry, I don't mean like over the right things, but over the, the silly things like you're breaking the law speeding. Somebody else does it and you want them to get the judgment, not you, right? Are you angry that way? Or are you so focused on what you know God's done for you that you want to really honor that for other people. And then finally, the last two things I want to remind you will go all the way back to point number one. Do you need to know that God is slow to get angry with you? Do you need to know that he is not upset with you every single time you make a mistake, but he's actually there as a loving father like we talked about last week, standing there waiting for you to come across the horizon so that he can run to you and love you well? Do you need to know that about God? Do you need a perspective shift about God that he's a God who's slow to anger with you? Or do you need the perspective shift that God is slow to anger? Because of the things that we do that grieve his heart will eventually make him angry. And eventually there will be a response. And a lot of times that response is his hand of protection is pulled off of us. Where are you at today? I had to ask myself this question so many times. Where am I at today? So with every head bowed and every eyes closed, I'm going to pray for us. So this is for all of us. This isn't a, I need a response. I need to see your hand in the air. And I, This is for all of us. God, help us be long-suffering. Help us look like you, slow to anger, patient, trusting in your wisdom and your righteousness and your judgment to be able to take care of the things and the people who have wronged us. Because the reality is, if I have such an anger towards somebody that if I see them in heaven in the future, the thought of that makes me upset, I'm in the wrong. So God, help me not be vengeful. Help me know that your justice may be introducing yourself to them so that their lives could change and that they could look like you and we could spend eternity worshiping with you. God, help me be reflective and not reactive. Help us be reflective and not reactive. And for those of us in this room that need to know that you're slow to get angry, that we realize that not, you're not up in heaven waiting for us to make a mistake. You're not up in heaven just, just you know, tapping your fingers together like, like some kind of menacing God that you're, you're actually up there with mercy. Your default, compa or your default attitude towards us is, is mercy 
is compassion. And it takes a long time for us to make you angry and God let us see that about you. But for those of us in this room that think it's okay to continue living life however we want to live it, God let us see that there is a reality that, that does grieve your heart, that does make you angry, that does get you to a place where you're ready to remove your protection from us. So Father, we pray that wherever we are in this room today that you would reveal what we need to see by your spirit that dwells within us. That we could truly know you And like I said, your default emotion, your baseline emotion towards us is mercy. And while we're still in a prayerful attitude, God, I, I pray as, I'm, as I'm, I'm here, I pray that in the next few minutes when I ask those people in this room that need to know you, would raise their hand and say, I need Jesus' mercy and compassion. I need the Father who's looking off into the distance, waiting for me to come home. And if you feel that in this room today, and that's you, and you don't know God, and you don't know his compassion and mercy for you, and you just learned about the potential uh, wrath that comes with the evil that is occurring in your life, there's an answer for that, and that answer is Jesus Christ who died on a cross for you. He gave up his life so that he died the death that you and I deserve so that we could live the life that he did. And that we could have the reward of being in heaven with him and the Father. He made a way when there was no way. And if that's you in this room, on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. One, God loves you. Two, you will never be the same. Three, if that's you, please raise your hand. I see your hand. Praise God. Praise God. As we sit here today, for you who raised your hand, that hand raise isn't something magical. There's no magical power in that, but the, the power is, the Bible tells us that those who confess with our mouths and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, they shall be saved. And so today, as we pray this prayer, I pray that you would say, Father, forgive me, for I know I've sinned, that I trust you, and I'm turning back to you. Trust and turn. We're going to repent, and our lives are going to look more like you today than it ever has before, but it's going to look more like you tomorrow than it does today, because we trust you. Father, I thank you for saving grace in this place today. I thank you for the fact that you've given us the opportunity to come into relationship with you. And I thank you for your love and your compassion and your goodness. It's in your mighty and precious name that we pray. Amen. If you just prayed or have any questions at all, feel free to let us know.